Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire. Now you might be able to tell from my voice, but it's 5.30am in the morning and I'm up early for what's going to be an unusual podcast because I'm turning back the clock about two centuries and today I'm going to be living on the diet of a rural poor labourer in Ireland before the famine. Now pre-famine Ireland is associated with one thing, and that's potatoes, not least because a failure in this crop in 1845 triggered the Great Famine. But the rural poor ate almost nothing else. The sheer amount of potatoes people ate is jaw-dropping. Their diet has to be one of the strangest in modern history. Adult males consumed about 6 kilos of potatoes every day. I have a big bowl of about 40 potatoes in front of me, if that helps you visualise it. So today I'm going to live on this diet, eating only potatoes, with the strange accompaniments from the early 19th century, from seaweed to water and pepper. Along the way I'll tell you what it's like to eat and what it tastes like, but you'll also hear great insights from Regina Sexton, a food historian and expert in culinary history who I interviewed last week. Now I do have one caveat, while I will be eating almost nothing but potatoes, and lots of them, I am making one exception. I'm going to allow myself coffee to start the day because without that I'm not going to be able to function. But while I prepare my coffee, I'll let Regina, the food historian, explain a bit more about the diet, who exactly ate it and what's ahead of me. When you look at the early decades of the 19th century and certainly um, in those years building up to uh, the Great Famine of 1845, I suppose what's, obviously there are lots of things that are noteworthy about Irish society, but one of them that strikes both commentators uh, inside and also outsiders that are traveling through the island is the nature of the diet particularly of uh, the rural and and the urban poor as well but particularly the the rural poor and I suppose that term rural poor is is, is a very broad umbrella term which covers um, a whole class of people from landless laborers who traveled migratory and were housed by farmers in terms of accommodation and, and food and so on but also you're talking about the, the, you know, the small farmer, maybe five, one to five acres, and then very, very small farmers with maybe an acre of land and, and large families. And the, I suppose the feature of those lives was the nature of the diet, the sheer volumes of potatoes that were consumed day in, day out. And uh, you can see from various different sources, uh, documentary sources from the period, uh, that the volumes were simply incredible. Um, and, you know, the calculation is that the average consumption per person per day was up to 14 pounds of potatoes. So that's kind of just over six kilograms. Um, But that, of course, would vary uh, in accordance with gender. You know, maybe maybe the father would eat more than the children and, 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 and the mother, for example. And also, of course, it would vary with season, depending on where you were actually in the agricultural patterning of the year and where you were in terms of your potato stocks within that agricultural system. Okay, so I've had my coffee and I'm feeling a bit more human now. So to start today, I'm going to boil about five medium-sized potatoes for breakfast. Now, if you're unfamiliar with potatoes, these will take about 30 minutes to boil. I'm cooking these on an electric hob, which obviously didn't exist in the 19th century. But while I prepare these, I'm going to let Regina explain how they would have prepared potatoes in the 19th century. What's going to determine your cooking method is the availability of utensils you have in the house. So it's open fire cooking in the first instance. So what they're doing is that, and you'll see this again in sort of the depictions and, and the, the descriptions of material culture of Ireland at this point in time. What you're talking about is the cooking pot for boiling the potatoes and a basket that's used for draining them. The cooking utensils, once the potato was cooked, then serve a secondary function as the eating place. So the, and the family gather in a communal uh, way around the basket without absolutely any other material object. So they're reaching by hand to the potato and it's the potato back to the mouth but even, I suppose, in the absence of those things, what you could do is kind of ember roast potatoes. So just put the potatoes in the, in, in the embers and let them cook through with, with the heat that's coming from the embers. Of course, in that instance, the skin will blacken. Um, so, so they'd have to pierce the skin and kind of, I suppose, squeeze out the flesh in that instance. So in terms of variety of cooking methods, that's limited. 
Uh, but that then will give you, I suppose, in this very monotonous and extraordinary diet of the rural poor, you, you can think about, I suppose, texture, you know, so a boiled potato will be one texture, an ember roasted potato will be a different texture again. So even within this poor system, uh, it has kind of procedures to make life a bit more diverse in that instance. And the other interesting thing, I suppose, as well, that, that, that to think about uh, is that, you know, we spoke about the, the increasingly narrow base of, of potato varieties that have been grown. Now, my breakfast of five potatoes is ready here, which I'm going to have. Now, a diet just of potatoes might sound very bland, but people did enhance the taste with lots of different dips and flavourings. We'll hear more about that in a minute. But just to tell you, I'm starting the day with the most familiar one to me and something I like, and that's butter. I don't think I'll have very much to say about this. I would often eat several potatoes in a meal with butter, so it's not going to be that abnormal. So while I tuck into my breakfast here, I'm going to let Regina talk a little bit more about the dips, flavourings and different ways people in the 19th century enhanced what was at times a very bland diet. And in terms of the monotony, very simply, at its most fundamental level and elemental level, what the diet was, was potatoes with some sort of accompaniment. Um, and that accompaniment would vary according to season and also according to region where, where, where you might find yourself living. But essentially what it was, was potatoes and a liquid accompaniment, like some sort of dip. And that liquid accompaniment could either be something like skimmed milk, buttermilk. Uh, it could simply be water with maybe pepper through it to add some flavor. Uh, or it could be something like salons, which is a kind of a fermented type of, of liquid uh, or jelly um, that's made with the residue of, of oats after they've been milled and processed and so on. So essentially what the diet was, was a potato and a dip. Um, and then depending on where, where you, you found yourself. So, for example, if you lived near the coast, uh, you could supplement that very monotonous and, and fundamental diet with things like uh, seaweeds, uh, shellfish. Um, for those maybe that were closer to areas of commercial activity, they could buy uh, cheap market foods, things like herrings, particularly salted, preserved herrings. Uh, but again, the sort of the ritual of consumption was the same in that it was predominantly the potato in these big, great volumes with some sort of flavoring or some sort of uh, piquancy of flavor or a desire to have that piquancy of flavor to break the monotony uh, in terms of the dip or something salty and so on. So I've had the first meal of the day and that was my breakfast. It was actually four potatoes, weighed about 500 grams. So that'd be about a 12th of the overall diet. It tasted fine, but already I can see there's no way I'm gonna make it through the entire six kilos of potatoes today. As I said, I've had four of about 40 potatoes and I feel pretty full now. That said, I do have a more active day than normal lined up ahead of me. So normally I spend my day sitting at a desk, recording, researching, writing, or editing podcasts. But today I'm going to try and walk about 20k, and also I've got some gardening lined up in my own house and in my mother's, so hopefully that'll help me work up an appetite. There's one other aspect, I guess, that's probably important about the way I'm going to eat the potatoes that is a bit different. So today I'm probably going to eat about four, maybe even five different smaller meals. But in the 19th century, people would have eaten potatoes slightly different. So I'm going to let Regina explain that. And I'm going to check back in with you in about a few hours time when I'm having my second meal of the day. I reckon it's seven o'clock now and I suspect maybe around 11 o'clock I might have another meal of potatoes. So I'll talk to you then. But in the meantime, Regina is going to explain exactly how people ate potatoes in terms of meal times. Again, it seems to be from the accounts that the the um, the meal times varied in accordance with the agricultural pattern of the year. So, so and and how full the stocks of potatoes were. So uh, when the stocks were going down, um, you'll read accounts of just two potato meals during the day. Um, but when they're a bit more secure, they talk about three potato meals um, during any any particular day. So they're the kind of the way the meal times, I suppose, punctuated the day. It's just about half ten now, and I have to admit that I'm actually hungrier than I thought I would be. So you might remember from my breakfast, I had four potatoes, and I thought I was full. But one aspect of this diet that struck me is the length of time it takes to eat potatoes, I think probably influences how 
full I feel. So I found that eating the potatoes takes longer than say other foods and I think that gave me a sense of being fuller than I was. Now for this meal I've cooked about 10 potatoes. I'm not going to eat them all now, I'm going to eat some later on. But I do have some of the accompaniments that Regina mentioned earlier. So these were skimmed milk, basically what remains behind when cream is removed from milk. Then there's buttermilk, a substance that remains behind when cream is turned into butter. Sounds a fermented liquid from oats and seaweed. She also mentioned a very bland water and pepper mixture. The only one of these I couldn't get my hands on was sounds, but I'm going to start by dipping the potatoes into buttermilk and I'll try the others later on in the day. Buttermilk, and I'm just looking at it now, has a thick kind of creamy texture. I've never actually tasted it raw. I have used it making bread before, but I'm pretty sure it tastes pretty bitter. But anyway, here goes. Yeah, it's pretty bitter, but it's actually not as bad as I expected it to be. I can definitely eat some more of this. I thought I actually might have to go back to butter, but I don't think I will. I think as it goes, it's not too bad at all. Um, I'm going to taste some of the other accompaniments later in the day, but after this meal, I'm going to head out to my mother's and do some gardening, and hopefully that'll work up an appetite. I'm going to bring a few spuds with me. That's one thing about them. They're very easily transported food. Now, while I'm on my way out to work up that appetite, I'll let Regina explain a bit about how healthy this diet was, and I'll check back in with you later. I suppose the thing that strikes a lot of people when they make these comments on the diet is that you're talking about this monotonous kind of, uh, you know, predominantly carbohydrate intake every day and throughout the day. And, and people will, will, I suppose, kind of rush to say that that seems to be a very unhealthy uh, diet in terms of the limitations of uh, nutrient intake and so on. But uh, I suppose when you look at the accounts, though, um, and the, the commentary on the effect, the, the physical effect of the diet on the Irish population, and especially when you look at comparative studies between this class of, of, of a kind of a lower socioeconomic grouping in Ireland and their counterparts in industrial Britain, um, what's noticeable is that the, this Irish potato dominated diet is actually very healthy. Because when you think about it, what it is, is that it's largely based on carbohydrates. You have uh, a protein element um, to that carbohydrate intake, particularly if potatoes are eaten with the skin on, because under the skin there is a protein layer. And then you have these the sorts of supplements to the diet will give you um, particularly things like seaweed and shellfish and so on, but also things like herring. They will give you important micronutrients, I suppose. And and also, um, it, it, I mean, we can't underestimate the importance and the prevalence of the herring in the diet uh, of Irish people until into the 20th century. The herring is a very nutritious fish as well, particularly in terms of the types of fats that are returned from the consumption of that fish. So what you're dealing with, I suppose, is a diet that is largely carbohydrate based, but then so too are diets through time uh, in a global universal sense. As Regina was saying there, the diet at the time was very healthy, but it's increasingly bland for me today as the day drags on. I was supposed to go to my mother's garden to work up an appetite, but she's away now, so that's been postponed until tomorrow. However, I'm not really sure it's really necessary. I don't think, no matter how much of an appetite I worked up, I'd be able to get through this diet. Numerous commentators at the time mentioned how bland the diet was, and already I'm feeling that. Any novelty has worn off and I'm just less and less enthused about the prospect of more potatoes. So to be honest, the less hungry I am, the better in many ways. While the buttermilk was better than I expected this morning, you might remember me saying that, I have to say it did leave a very strange aftertaste. So my initial foray into the accompaniments that went with the potato in the 19th century hasn't exactly helped. Now next I'm going to try some seaweed with the potatoes to see if that helps at all. So what I'm going to do there is I have some dillisk that I was able to buy in a health food shop and I've had that soaking in water and I'm going to mash up some potatoes with a bit of butter and see what that tastes like. While I prepare that, in the meantime, Regina is going to explore some of the negative effects of this diet. Now the greatest of these was the over-reliance on the potato which had disastrous consequences during the Great Famine. It becomes uh, monocultural, but also it becomes monocultural at a different level in that a, a lot of the rural poor are actually narrowing down the varieties of potatoes that, are, that they're cultivating for domestic home production. 
So you have this monoculture, uh, a restriction of the potato varieties, of course, which isn't a good idea. And what's happening in that sense is those, those environmental pressures on the returns uh, brings a very negative, I suppose, consequence or side effect of all of those kinds of different pressures coming together. So what you see in the diet, we've just spoken about in terms of the volumes and so on consumed, but what happens is that that diet is subject in the first instance to uh, an element of seasonal collapse. So when you come into mon months like July and August, what's happening here is that you're in the transition period between exhausting the, the stores of potatoes that you have from, from the harvest of the previous year, and then you're waiting to pull the new crop. So in that transitional period of July and August, you have seasonal collapse. And in a society where you don't have a social security system, what's happening is that you have um, sections of the population are thrown into periods of, of, of hunger and want. Uh, you know, they call it hungry July and July of, 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 of the cabbages. Uh, people are consuming what they, can, what they can get cheaply at the market if they have the resources to do that. They're consuming things like wild mustard or charlock and collecting wild foods, going to the coast and trying to collect um, foods that are available and can be gleaned and gathered for free. Um, so within that context, I suppose, that's a very negative and dangerous aspect of the diet. But then what's happening increasingly to, to kind of push it further to this precipice of disaster is what's happening increasingly through those early decades of the 19th century is that the sheer pressure uh, on land uh, to return more crops for a very swollen population at this point is that you see kind of areas of um, localized famine where the crop will just fail or it will fail to return uh, in the quantities that the rural poor are used to consuming. So in those instances what you have is localized famines complicated by seasonal collapse and I suppose an indication of the insecurity of the food system at this point where, where, where it has reached by the 1820s and 30s, the, the, uh, I suppose an indication of those insecurities is first of all in the, in the extension of the Poor Law Act to Ireland at this period, but also in a very other physical real way is the importation of um, cheap food uh, before the famine and that, that, that comes in the form of Indian meal or maize or corn that's being introduced into Ireland to try and alleviate um, the cracks that are becoming increasingly apparent in the system. So I have my third meal of the day ready here folks and that comprises of potatoes obviously but on this occasion I've mixed in some seaweed which is dillisk and some butter. Now I've tasted dillisk before so I'm kind of hopeful that I like this one. So I'm going to give it a bash here. Oh, that is not nice. Um, that's really not nice. So the dill kind of tastes, if you can imagine, is a taste of what the sea smells like. And mixed with the potatoes, it's really not nice. I can't eat any more of that. I actually think it might make me unwell if I tried to eat any more of it. I have to say at this point, I am starting to struggle with this diet. Uh, I don't know why, I actually really like potatoes, but it's about three o'clock in the afternoon now and I'm still only, I think I've eaten about 10, maybe 11 potatoes so far today. I oh, know this would be, if I'd eaten this meal, that would have been 10 or 11, but I'm, that's about a quarter of the overall diet. There's no way I'll even get to half, but um, what I might do is try and cook some more and eat them with skimmed milk and water and pepper. In the meantime, Regina is going to talk next about something really interesting. And that's how people in the 19th century made potatoes stretch further in these times of crisis that she referenced earlier. So while there's huge times of food shortages, there were things people could do to make their potatoes stretch much further. Now, I'm not going to do this because I'm pretty certain if I tried to cook potatoes like this, it would make me pretty ill. But Regina explains what people did. The various different accounts of people just half cooking their potatoes, I suppose, especially in these times of crisis when the stocks are old or when you have kind of localised collapse or localised famines. And that seems very kind of strange to us, but actually it makes perfect sense because if you half cook a potato and cut it through the centre, 
what you'll see is that the center uncooked lump of potato, they're, 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 they kind of have two textures here. They have the uncooked texture, but they also have the cooked potato on the outside bit. They're eating that as normal. Um, and then they're, they're going to consume the hard core, the uncooked core, because what, what they say is that they, they eat that uh, and it takes longer to digest in the stomach. So therefore it will keep hunger away for a bit longer. So while I'm not going to try and eat that, I do have meal number four of the day ready here. Um, I will say I'm sitting somewhere else, so the recording sound might be slightly different. But in this meal, I've got plenty of potatoes and several different dips. So I do have one more with potato and dillisk, that's the seaweed. Again, I posted a picture of what I tried to eat the last time, and someone on Twitter, that's Barry O'Donovan, thanks very much, Barry, commented to say that I'd used too much dillisk. So this time I've got far less dillisk, so I'm going to try that. I also have some just plain potatoes and I've got some skimmed milk which I'm going to try and I also have the pepper water which apparently as Regina told us earlier on in the show was a common accompaniment for potatoes. So I think I'm going to start off with the skimmed milk. Now I think I am not going to like this. I was talking to someone who described skimmed milk to me and I didn't like the sound of it but I am going to try it now and see what that tastes like. So I've just dipped the potato in the skimmed milk and I'm about to taste it. I have to say there's not very much of a taste of anything of it. Uh, skimmed milk in its texture is very thin. It's not like buttermilk I had earlier on in the day, which is much thicker and I suppose sticks to, to the potato. Yeah, I've had another piece of it there and I have to say I just don't really taste anything there. Next, I'm gonna try the pepper water. Now this is literally just pepper and water. I imagine this will be tasty enough. It'll just be like having, I suppose, a bit of pepper on the potato. Hmm. I actually think of everything I've had. Uh, this is the nicest. Well, it's just pepper and water. It is actually nicer than you'd anticipate. And the pepper on the potato definitely is a nice contrast. Definitely. And actually, you can see how mixing it with water does actually give it a different type of flavor. Now the third accompaniment I have for the potatoes is uh, the dillisk, but this time I've used far less dillisk than I did the last time. I am a bit dubious to be honest, I am not so sure I like the idea of potatoes and dillisk in any form. But here goes. Yeah, it's okay. I'm, uh, as I say, I'm not so sure I would like it, but I can eat it this time. The last time I wasn't able to eat it and I think it was just because I had too much seaweed now I'm going to go and finish this meal, but in the meantime, I've got some more information about what other people in 19th century Ireland ate. So obviously today I've just focused on the diet of the rural poor, but when I was preparing this, Regina sent me lots of information about what other classes in society would have eaten. So the first group are more wealthy farmers, and Regina sent on an article with extracts from the diary of a man called Humphrey O'Sullivan, who lived in the early 19th century here in Kilkenny actually and his very detailed diary gives us a sense of what wealthier farmers would have eaten. Now I've recorded some sections of that diary to give you a sense of what he might have been eating because it's a lot different to what I've been trying out today and actually sounds a lot more tasty to be honest. Friday June 20th 1828. I had dinner with Father James Hennebury. We had two fine fat sweet substantial trout. One of them was as big as a small salmon. We had hard-boiled hen eggs and cooked vegetables soaked in melted butter on boiled new milk and salt. We had port wine and punch as good as ever I drank. Friday, July 30th, 1830. The diet of my family and myself as follows. A hot breakfast consisting of oatmeal stirabout made on milk. Wheat and bread and milk at one o'clock. This is a cool midday meal. And potatoes and meat and butter toward late evening. Tuesday, 19th of October, 1830. A mild night which I passed happily at Michael Hickey's, eating juicy, fat, dainty beef and tender, sweet mutton and merrily drinking sweet, strong punch till midnight in the company of the parish priest and Richard Cullerton and the host and his wife, who is a cousin of the priest. While Humphrey O'Sullivan represents a more comfortable class in society than the rural poor, Regina is now going to explain what the elite of society would have eaten and in many ways it's not that different to today. After this I'm going to come back and give my final thoughts on trying out this pre-famine diet. I suppose the first thing to bear in mind is that uh, by the 18th century um, 
most of the ingredients that we are familiar with today, now I'm kind of excluding things like maybe chilies or lemongrass and all sorts of stuff. But if you think about the kind of the mainstream availability of ingredients that are accessible and available to us today, um, they're all here by the 18th century. But again, it depends on who you are and where you are in terms of your ability to access. And of course, the knowledge of how to cook and consume these things in a ritual or even a practical way. So when you look at uh, places like the cities, you know, like Dublin, and especially cities like Cork, which is quite cosmopolitan in its outlook and its activities throughout the 18th century, uh, and you look at the trade accounts of things that are coming into Cork, the Port of Cork, for example, combining with, with the, the variety of ingredients that can be home produced, the varieties and the availability of things is quite extraordinary. Or even if you look at, you know, what I love doing is looking at the grocers' advertisements in the newspapers and all the things they advertise, uh, it's quite extraordinary. And they're not just advertising things like sugar or dried fruits or asparagus. They're, they're advertising different varieties of sugar, depending on how it's processed. And they're, they're, they're advertising all the different varieties of dried fruits, again, depending on what variety is being dried and how it's been sort of processed. So the, the kind of the knowledge and the uh, demand for variety in commonplace ingredients is quite extraordinary. And then if you go along and you look at things like the seed catalogues, you know, like a catalogue that you might look at to plan for what you might grow the following year. If you look at the seed catalogues in Ireland in the 18th and 19th centuries, this is again extraordinary. And the varieties of things like lettuce and peas and cabbages uh, is kind of mind blowing. Uh, and that doesn't even start to bring in sort of the exotic things that have been cultivated and grown in Ireland, things like, you know, things like peaches, nectarines, pineapples, and all sorts of stuff. So this, uh, this knowledge of food and the variety of food that's coming in and that's being home produced is extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. And I suppose that's best represented and we get most information and in piecing together what that diet might be by looking at, I suppose, what you, at the other end of the scale, you, you, you might think about looking at the diets of the Irish elites, for example. You know, the kind of the gentry, the aristocracy, or those uh, who are aspiring to, to accession to those orders. And that diet can be put together, I suppose, very well by looking at what are called the manuscript receipt books. And these are the manuscript recipe books from um, houses written predominantly by women. Uh, and these are handwritten books of recipes that are kept by the house and extended to the cook and so on. And th they're absolutely fascinating uh, when you look at not just the variety of ingredients that are being used, but also in terms of the sophisticated ways in which these ingredients are being treated in the kitchen. The sounds of that diet are absolutely mouth-watering compared to what I've had today. But I want to finish up the show by just talking a little bit about the diet and kind of what my reflections on it are. So overall, it's very bland, and I suppose that's almost a statement of fact. I'm, I've largely been eating just potatoes. I can't imagine what it's like to eat this all the time with very little variety. That said, some of the accompaniments are better than others. The skimmed milk, I have to say, almost added no flavour. I couldn't taste any difference uh, having eaten that. The buttermilk was nice, but I found it quite bitter, um, and certainly the aftertaste was strange. Now, I guess that's just because I don't drink buttermilk, so I'm not familiar with the taste. The disc, well, we've been through that. I think the first time I put in too much, even the second time, though, I'm not massively keen on that flavour. But again, it's probably an acquired taste. And then finally, the pepper water, I thought was pretty nice, actually, and as an accompaniment, was surprisingly nice, more so than just normal pepper. I guess the ultimate proof of this is the question, could I continue eating like this? Ultimately, I've gotten through about a third of what an adult male labourer would get through. Am I, I'm still a bit hungry. I don't feel like eating more potatoes. Could I live on it? I guess I could. Do I want to? I definitely don't. And I'm not sure I'll be eating any more potatoes this week. But it is interesting nonetheless to get some insight into just that how bland that diet was. The fact that our ancestors lived not only for months like this, but year on year just shows us how much our diets have developed. And I think part of the problem for me trying to eat this is that I'm used to too many flavours. Like if you think on a daily basis, all the different types of flavours that we eat, and then this is all being reduced back when you have this diet just to 
a handful of different flavors and i've noticed for example there's very little sugar in this diet and i think that is something i did miss even just i'm talking a couple of hours of doing this or a day of doing this and you really miss sugar i guess in conclusion it's a pretty bland diet you could do it but you probably wouldn't want to Okay, folks, that's where I'm going to leave the show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I, the last thing I want to do is thank Regina Sexton for her time and insights. They were really fascinating and I think it really made the show. I'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, Sloan. Mm-hmm.